1996, Super Mario 64 proved to the world that three dimensions was the logical next step for gaming to take. The game set the precedent for nearly all forthcoming 3D platformers and collectathons of the era, but few were able to rival its creativity, precision, and immersiveness. The GameCube's reveal in the year 2000 represented another massive technological leap and the potential of another revolution in what a 3D platformer game could be. Since Mario initially spearheaded the leap to 3D to widely acclaimed results, many looked to his next outing in anticipation of what was yet to come. During this time, Nintendo struggled to figure out how they would follow up 64. Multiple direct sequels were planned and ultimately scrapped. Shortly after the release of Majora's Mask, Yoshiaki Koizumi took on the role of director for the next 3D Mario game, and his idea featured Mario using a water pump. The setting was determined shortly after, and the game was developed in its entirety in just about 18 months. And with that, Super Mario Sunshine was released on August 26, 2002 in North America. The game's identity and design was undoubtedly shaped by the circumstances of its development, both for better and worse. Although the direct Mario 64 sequels were scrapped, the team still wanted to create within the framework laid out by 64. This meant open stages with varied objectives, an expressive movement system, and a lush setting. There is no doubt in my mind that some of the most interesting elements of this game wouldn't have made it into the final game, had it not been for the rush development cycle. But the reverse is also true. Had the team been given a few extra months to reevaluate the game and polish its imperfections, I think we could have gotten a much better product. As it stands now, Super Mario Sunshine is an absolute mess. It's filled to the brim with glitches, padding, poorly designed objectives, and an inconsistent difficulty curve. It is by far the most divisive mainline Mario game, and I completely get why. As I get older and analyze the media I consume through a more critical lens, I occasionally have to contend with the fact that I don't enjoy the things I hold dear as much as I used to. Sunshine was one of the first Mario games I ever played, and it's one of the few games I had during my childhood. That alone makes it special to me, but I'll also always carry with me the memories of exploring Isle Delfino for the first time and messing about with Mario's movement. But even on a gameplay level, I used to love Super Mario Sunshine. I knew it had issues, but I genuinely found the game to be incredibly engaging from front to back. If you had asked me a few years ago, I probably would have declared it one of my favorite games ever made. While I still do enjoy it quite a bit, it has fallen down the ranks drastically. In this video, I want to explore why that is. I have quite a complicated relationship with this game, and while I may have some choice words, I hope you'll hear me out. This is Super Mario Sunshine. Super Mario Sunshine begins with Mario and the gang inside a plane, heading for Isle Delfino to take a vacation. The plane's landing is obstructed by a goopy piranha occupying the runway, and it is here where Mario finds this game's main gimmick, the Flood Water Jet. The island's judicial system then finds Mario guilty of polluting the island after a shadowy figure resembling him was spotted, and he is sentenced to cleaning up the entire island. This setup for Sunshine is unlike anything the mainline Mario games have ever had, and for that I appreciate it, even if the voice acting is pretty awful. The island from becoming any dirtier. The perpetrator is likely at work even as we speak. But I think this is indicative of just how bold this game truly is. After all, one of Sunshine's greatest strengths is its thematic cohesion. Unlike the Mushroom Kingdom, Every area in the game is united under one central aesthetic, a tropical island. The developers couldn't fall back on the standard snow level, grass level, lava level that already felt played out. It required them to get creative, and it resulted in a believable setting where each stage still felt like it had its own unique identity. Isle Delfino feels like a fully realized location as a result. Rico Harbor is a shipping port with a ton of ongoing construction projects and a town square overlooking it. Noki Bay is a cliffside body of water on the outskirts of the island, Serena Beach is a stunning beach featuring a giant hotel, and Pina Park is a destination amusement park, with tons of rides and sights to behold. Pianta Village is home to some of the residents of Isle Delfino, 
the Piantas. All of these areas make total sense in the context of the greater setting, and it lends the game this unparalleled sense of immersion. This immersion is reinforced by tons of little details throughout the game. Depending on where you are on the island, the other stages can be observed off in the distance. For example, Pina Park and Rico Harbor can be seen while in Bianco Hills. This really sells the feeling that you are traveling to different parts of the island, and each stage exists just a small distance away from one another. This game also conveys this sense of immersion through its level design. Missing a jump in Mario games of the past would typically result in you falling to your death in a bottomless pit. Respawning will place you either at the beginning of the stage or a checkpoint, and booting you out of the level in the process in some cases. Sunshine features a distinct lack of insta-kill hazards when compared to those games. They still do exist, but they are few and far between. Tricky platforming sections are placed over bodies of water or high above the ground, as opposed to bottomless pits. Neither of those things will kill you outright, so you'll begrudgingly make your way back up to where you were in the platforming challenge. The game utilizes inconvenience as a punishment for failure, rather than death. There are differing opinions on whether or not that is a good design choice, but I err on the side of positivity here. I feel this way mostly because by not killing the player, they do not get booted out of the level and thus their immersion is left intact. It's far less monotonous than dying over and over in 64 just to get placed at the beginning of the level every time. There isn't a single main stage that features floating platforms attached to nothing. Every single platform on Isle Delfino is contextualized somehow. Bianco Hill's moving platforms are attached to a windmill atop a hill, so it makes sense in this world that they'd be moving. Noki Bay has hidden tunnels carved out in the side of the mountain. Rico Harbor has scaffolding spanning nearly the entire level. Sunshine never asks you to suspend disbelief like in prior games. Every single platform makes sense in their given setting. Well, until you enter the secret stages, but we'll get to that in due time. Even some of the game's objectives contribute to the feeling that Isle Delfino is lived in. One of my favorites is Mysterious Hotel Delfino in Serena Beach. It has you jumping all throughout the hotel in different rooms in search of a pineapple. While navigating through it, you'll see all these Piantas and Nokis occupying the rooms. Noki Bay tells a story as you progress through its shines, wherein you must find the source of the poison in the water. You'll attempt many different remedies until you find the true source is a poisonous eel at the ocean floor. Something that always stood out to me was the fact that there are heat waves over some of the objects and level geometry that are further away from the camera. A tropical island in the middle of summer is definitely hot, so it's just something that helps sell the setting in a subtle way. Speaking of visual elements, this game looks remarkably good for its time. Environments and objects within them are full 3D models rather than 2D sprites, so everything is much more visible and clearly defined. Also, just look at this water. What an incredible achievement. The final example I'd like to posit is the game's music. Bianco Hills, Rico Harbor, and Gelato Beach all feature the same melody in their respective themes just with their own unique instrumentation. Bianco Hills utilizes wind instruments, Rico Harbor is a saxophone and electric guitar, and Gelato Beach uses steel drums. On your first playthrough, you may not have even noticed that all these songs had an overlapping melody because of how distinct each track manages to sound. I know I certainly didn't. These songs all sharing the same motif symbolize the island's interconnectivity. As you get further into the game, Stages start to contain their own unique themes. It doesn't feel jarring though, as these tracks serve to bolster the atmosphere of each stage. A great example is Noki Bay's slower, more subdued theme. Peanut Park has a gleeful piano theme that screams eating cotton candy walking through a carnival.
This soundtrack ties all the elements of this game's presentation together beautifully. And of course, who could forget about Delfino Plaza? Delfino Plaza might just be one of the best hub worlds in any game I've ever played, and I'd imagine I'm not alone in that sentiment. This area is the town square of Isle Delfino, and it's your avenue of going from place to place. The first three areas are all entered through similar means, but as the game continues, entrances to new stages get progressively more creative. Instead of allowing you to walk up to an M graffiti, Serena Beach requires you ride Yoshi to eat the pineapple blocking the pipe to enter. Pina Park has you hop into a cannon and blast across this massive body of water. Pianta Village asks you to rocket up on top of the skyscraping Shine Gate, which I didn't even think you could do on my first playthrough. And perhaps my favorite, standing on this specific platform in front of the fountain and looking up directly at the sun will take you to Noki Bay. It's such a charming callback to one of the most iconic hidden stars in Mario 64, and the way that it fits flawlessly in the setting of this game makes it even more satisfying. And those are just the main stage entrances. There is so much to do in this town square that it could have been its own entire game. Exploring the area just for the sake of it is incredibly fun because there are so many interesting things to see, like the various Pianta interactions. Even just hearing the text crawl sound effect when somebody talks to me sends a rush of dopamine through my brain. <laughs> I also love the little news bar at the bottom of the screen. It's as if a bunch of Piantas are sitting around their TV watching your gameplay. These elements may seem small, but they come together to give the area this unparalleled sense of character. But perhaps the best part of Delfino Plaza is the sheer number of hidden collectibles and objectives dispersed throughout it. Excluding the final boss and the shines you get from trading in blue coins, there are 15 shines up for grabs. There's also a secret area within Delfino Plaza that offers another shine, but that one is counted separately. Some of these shines require you to complete a platforming challenge, collect a certain number of red coins, or just be observant enough to notice when things look out of the ordinary. Like Mario 64, there's this sense of wonder whenever you notice something that may seem small like spraying goop off a bell or rocketing yourself into the air and getting rewarded with a shine. Delfino Plaza rocks. And honestly, it's one of my favorite parts of the entire game. While I may not care much for Flood as a character, I can absolutely appreciate how great of a mechanic it is in gameplay. It serves as a compelling differentiator to Mario 64, greatly expanding your movement and utility options. Broadly, it's used to spray water, but this is applied in many different ways. The default squirt nozzle is your main facet of interacting with the world, as it's used to fight enemies, clean goop, and uncover secrets. In the original release of Sunshine on GameCube, Flood's squirt nozzle was impacted by how far you pressed the triggers on the GameCube controller, thanks to their analog input. This allowed you to spray a small amount of water and still move around with Mario, or you could press them all the way in and come to a complete stop with a stronger blast. In retrospect, this was one of the best implementations of the analog triggers on the console, and for many people is reason to declare that the definitive version of the game. The hover nozzle does exactly what you'd imagine. It allows you to hover. While in midair, you can press down on the trigger and glide through the air for about 2 seconds. It's a versatile move. You can use it to clear some extra distance, you can use it to turn, albeit very slowly, and you can even use it to gain just the slightest bit of height. The other nozzles, while still useful, are very situational. The rocket nozzle allows you to launch Mario to insane heights, and the turbo nozzle turns you into Sonic the Hedgehog. There are only a handful of collectibles and scenarios that mandate these nozzles, but they are both worthy additions that add a great deal of variety to Mario's moveset. Mario's base movement has been carried over from 64, with the exception of the long jump. The hover nozzle practically serves as a replacement to that move, but that also means that you can't clear long distances as quickly and fluidly as before. Aside from that, Mario's movement has been refined to near perfection here. Moves like the triple jump and side flip come out so much quicker and are easier to perform, and platforming feels incredible. The wall jump has been improved with the addition of Mario sliding down the wall after making contact with it to allow a much wider time frame to jump. 
The side flip in particular has become one of my favorite moves because of how much verticality it offers, and it demands far less of you than 64 did. If you're in a pinch in a tighter area, simply side flip and wall jump and you'll clear the obstacle effortlessly. There is one new move that has been added, and it happens to be another one of my favorites, the spin. Give your control stick a 360 degree twirl, and Mario will begin spinning rapidly. You can start spraying water with flood to cover a ton of ground around you, or you can jump in the air and fly to ridiculous heights. What makes this so great is that you descend fairly slowly, so you can clear a good amount of horizontal distance, especially if you link this move with the hover nozzle. Perhaps my favorite application of this move is spin jumping into a wall jump, and then using the hover nozzle to gain even more height and distance. The sheer amount of combinations possible with the moves in this game alone make it incredibly satisfying to play, no matter your skill level. If you recall, one of my biggest criticisms of the movement in Mario 64 was that upon changing the direction Mario was moving, he'd perform this wide U-turn that would often make you fall on tight platforms. Well, I'm happy to report that this issue has been completely fixed. He still does a U-turn, but it is far less of a nuisance than it was in 64. I'm not sure that it has ever killed me even once in this game. Flood will be your main avenue of mid-air correction, but even without him, you have far more control than 64 in this regard. You aren't as committed to the direction of a jump in Sunshine, as you are simply able to pull back on the control stick, and Mario will go back to the ledge he was on, provided you didn't jump far horizontally. Thanks to both Flood and the improved base movement, all of my criticisms of Mario 64's movement have been addressed. The end result is quite possibly the best movement of any 3D Mario game to date. New players have the crutch of Flood to rely on, while more experienced players can experiment and optimize their movement with little restriction. Although I believe Flood to be a good inclusion, my favorite objectives to play through have always been the secret stages, because they feature the most involved and engaging platforming in the entire game. On your first run through, you don't have that luxury of relying on Flood to correct your mistakes, as Shadow Mario takes him from you. There's also a great objective in Pianta Village that sees you being separated from Flood and the surface of the stage being covered in fiery goop. You'll have to navigate around it to reunite with him, but the path there is treacherous. The intended route is to go to the underside of the village, and overcoming the challenges down there isn't easy. In both of these scenarios, you are being tested on your acclimation to Mario's base movement, and overcoming that limitation makes these challenges incredibly satisfying. Another addition to the game that shakes up the movement is Yoshi. He kinda gets a lot of shit for his appearance in this game. While some of it is warranted, I've never been able to fully get behind that. I think that some of the objectives he's required for left a bad taste in people's mouths. <coughs> it is definitely true that Yoshi has way less variety in how he can move compared to Mario, and forcing those limitations onto Mario can feel a bit suffocating. However, possibly the best move in the entire game is only accessible with Yoshi. Doing a spin jump while on Yoshi's back sends you soaring into the air, and you can combine this move with his flutter jump to reach even greater heights. He controls just as tightly as Mario, so in that regard he feels like an extension of his movement. I do think that he could have used a few more unique attributes to fully justify limiting Mario's movement, and he's woefully underused across the entire game so it's hard to say for certain if he was a worthy inclusion. As it stands now though, I'm fine with him being here. I just think there was a lot of untapped potential. Overall, I adore the movement in Sunshine. It's Mario 64 on crack, and that makes it a joy to play around with. Had the devs not experimented with Mario's moveset in this game, I think my enjoyment of it would have been hurt substantially. Alright, I've been saying that I have some harsh opinions on this game, but I've mostly been positive so far. Let's go ahead and rip that band-aid off. My most recent playthrough of Sunshine felt strangely dull. I remembered this game having an astonishing variety of objectives that were all engaging and fulfilling to complete. This time around, so much of the content in the game felt repetitive, boring, and uninspired. And I think I might know why. Sunshine fails to stick the landing in the most crucial area for a Mario game, its objectives and its progression. Mario 64's objectives rarely ask much of you, but they at least hit an acceptable baseline of quality. I enjoy scouring the levels and tackling a variety of different tasks unique to their locations. 
Sunshine, however, relies far too heavily on recycling content and failing to present a consistent level of enjoyable challenges. And that frustrates me, because there is genuinely so much to love about this game. The unparalleled sense of immersion in a setting I adore, the experimental and snappy control setup, the goofy tone, but it isn't enough to counteract its problems. There are two gameplay styles packed within Sunshine, and they feel at odds with each other. There's the slower, more explorative gameplay, and the faster, more exciting platforming in mostly the secret areas. The issue is that both of these gameplay styles are flawed in their own unique ways. The exploration-based objectives rarely ever present fun or engaging challenges, to the point where a lot of the game feels redundant. I'm not particularly compelled by spraying 10 piantos out of fiery goop, spraying cataquacks off of mirrors, pushing watermelons, and chasing Shadow Mario. And I'm especially not compelled by doing this type of thing multiple times. Seriously, you chase Shadow Mario 11 fucking times in this game, it's absurd. They don't alter these changes in any meaningful ways, so it just feels like your time is being wasted. You fight the Gooper Blooper boss three separate times, you fight that Goopy Piranha like five times with no changes, there are multiple shines where your only objective is to clean the surface of a stage, you race Il Piantissimo three times, you give Chain Chomps a bath just a few shines apart, it genuinely gets exhausting. The red coin missions from Mario 64 make a return, and they are the worst offender of repetition. In total, there are 24 shines to get from collecting red coins. There are 120 total shines, which means that over one-sixth of the overall shine count is made up by these missions. Super Mario 64 had 23 red coin missions total, but they played a lot differently than the ones in Sunshine. In 64, red coin missions only appeared once per stage, and they could be combined with 100 coin stars to optimize your time, as one red coin is equal to two regular coins. You aren't able to do this in Sunshine, so it accentuates how lackluster they are as objectives. 64 containing double the amount of worlds that Sunshine has created the illusion that they were spread apart, despite the raw numbers being almost equal. Bianco Hills, for example, has four red coin missions out of 11, which is a bit much. So many of these red coin missions in Sunshine are total retreads. Every single secret stage has a red coin mission, and there's even a red coin in Serena Beach that has you doing literally the exact same thing you did in Episode 3. They are rarely ever a challenge to collect, and for that reason they feel monotonous. On the flip side, some of the stages in Sunshine can be massive spikes in difficulty, and I suspect that was not the ultimate goal of the developers. The hardest stage's difficulty is mostly a product of how janky this game can be, not as a product of intricate level design or unique challenges. There's the infamous Pachinko level that asks you to collect 8 red coins inside it, but the caveat is that you don't actually get to control Mario. Stepping on this launch pad forfeits the mid-air control the player has over him, and you'll likely die many times in the process of attaining this shine. I've been playing this game for most of my life, and I still don't have a consistent strategy for grabbing this one. You kinda just have to spray the hover nozzle in the direction you want to go and pray. Another shine that asks you to pray is the secret Chuckster stage in Pianta Village. There are long stretches of bottomless pits without any platforms to jump on, so you'll need to rely on these Piantas here to throw you across. The angle they throw you at is predicated entirely on where they turn to talk to Mario. You have very little control over how they do this, so the best strategy is to just align yourself right in the middle of their body, facing the direction of the next platform. This can be difficult to get right continuously, because the Piantas are always walking in various directions, or you have to contend with the enemies as you try to talk to them. It's a mess. This stage just isn't the kind of difficulty I'd like to see in a sandbox platformer game. Stages like those previously mentioned feel like they're from a totally different game when juxtaposed with the super easy Shadow Mario chases and watering sunflowers in Pina Park, or spraying goop off the surface of a stage. It's not even that there's anything inherently wrong with these sorts of objectives, it's just that they don't really complement each other in terms of difficulty. Like I said, the fact that these borderline broken stages crop up at seemingly random points in the game lead me to believe that the difficulty in them was unintentional. Those are my thoughts on the exploration-based objectives, so let's discuss my issues with the platforming-based ones. My main problem is that despite providing great challenges, Many of them feel disconnected from the rest of the game, both in a gameplay sense and an environmental sense. First, let's establish what we mean by a platforming-based objective. 
It's hard to objectively determine, but for the sake of this discussion, I'll include anything that requires an equal or greater amount of jumping and quick movements as the EOP Antissimo races. This means that things like Corona Mountain, the Cage Shine Sprite in Rico Harbor, and the Runaway Ferris Wheel in Pina Park, along with pretty much every secret stage in the game count. Jumping a few times to get up to the watermelon in Gelato Beach doesn't count. Looking at the objectives this way, I would say that charitably there are roughly 40 shines that are platforming focused. This number excludes blue coins, because that would muddy the waters very quickly. The challenges these shines present vary greatly, so for that reason some of them may not feel like they're dedicated entirely to platforming, and may just feel like exploring the area. The level where you unplug the cork in Noki Bay comes to mind. I have no issue with objectives like that and the aforementioned Rico Harbor one, because they take place within the environment, and often present fun challenges. They just aren't as engaging as the best platforming sections in the game. The vast majority of the dedicated platforming objectives take place in the secret stages, and these are usually my favorite levels to tackle because of how involved they are. Unlike the levels I mentioned before, these are actually meant to be difficult, and they play just as you'd expect them to. My problem is that for a game that is so focused on creating a consistent setting, it feels awfully out of place to divert from it so often. Secret platforming stages take place in this generic, retro Mario-esque void, and it completely shatters my immersion. Imagine how cool it could have been to walk into one of the caves in Bianco Hills, and the backdrop of the level is a water filtration or sewage system under Isle Delfino. Or you walk into the shell in Noki Bay and the walls are all swirling pink, they could have even made the theme universal, and had all the entrances just bring you down to the bottom of the ocean, where there are obstacle courses set up for you. Just something. Including the Sandbird, there are 10 secret stages that must be completed to unlock the final boss. There are 9 hidden shines in the form of red coins in those areas, and there are 3 secret area shines in Delfino Plaza. This brings us to a total of 22 platforming based secret area shines. It's disappointing that by far my favorite parts of the game are soured by how disconnected they feel from the rest of it. I'm a total sucker for beachy settings and tricky platforming, and the game rarely if ever lets me have both at the same time. And it's sad because it totally could have been done. Once again, Rico Harbor and Noki Bay are proof of this. And by the way, I don't even fault the developers for this. I'd hate to insinuate that they're just lazy or something. I'm sure they would have absolutely loved to place these objectives throughout the world in areas that made contextual sense, or spent more time crafting engaging explorative objectives. This is yet another area of the game I feel suffered greatly as a product of how rushed the game was. Okay, but if this game is taking cues from Mario 64, you should be able to skip the bad stuff, right? You may be thinking. And that would be a great point, but the problem is, you can't. Sunshine has 7 main stages and you must chase down Shadow Mario in every single one to unlock the final boss. The problem is that Shadow Mario only appears in episode 7 of each stage, which means that you have to clear episodes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 beforehand. There is no negotiation, you have to get all 49 of these shines in the exact order the game lays out for you. I'm not a fan of this. The freedom to collect any star you'd like and have it contribute to getting you closer to the final boss in 64 is what makes it so replayable. 64's structure allows you to skip entire levels if you so choose, and Sunshine has nothing to make up for that. I would have liked to return to the Mario 64 style of progression, where each stage has multiple stars available to you from the get-go, but that really isn't feasible in Sunshine. Since the stages change in between shines so often, there would have been limits to what these shines could ask you to do. I can't deny that the storytelling throughout the stages I lauded earlier wouldn't be possible without this structure. You can at the very least tackle stages in the late game out of order, but that's only if you've been collecting extraneous shines. Oh yeah, that's another thing this episodic structure does. Every single one of the hidden shines, shines in Delfino Plaza, and shines gotten from collecting blue coins are completely worthless. They do not get you any closer to unlocking the final boss, if that's your main goal. On your first playthrough, you could be trudging through something like the Pachinko Machine level, or wasting your time traveling back to the Poison River level, and not even realize it was a total waste of time until you've unlocked the final boss. This will no doubt lead many players to just focus on the main objectives, but ironically, I think you'd be doing yourself a disservice by playing this way. While there are some worthwhile main objectives, 
I find that the hidden shines and shines associated with blue coins are much more fulfilling to collect. Yes, I actually do like collecting blue coins. Having a collectible that rewards me purely for my own curiosity is a godsend. I can aimlessly run around these stages, searching far and wide to my heart's content. But even I can't defend these things in their current state. Let's make one thing clear. Blue coins are not a bad idea. It's just that their execution in this game is horrible. These things are found in pretty much every nook and cranny throughout each stage, and there are 240 total. Every main stage houses 30, with Delfino Plaza and Corona Mountain having 20 and 10 respectively. Simple enough, right? <laughs> it won't be that easy. The developers went out of their way to make sure that getting all 240 of these things would be as convoluted of a process as possible. For starters, this game doesn't even tell you how many coins are in each stage, just how many you've collected. You either need to guess or just look up the number online. It also doesn't tell you which coins within each level you've gotten, so you have to keep track via a list or something. And that's not even the worst part. A good amount of the blue coins in Sunshine are specific to certain episodes of their respective stages. For instance, there's a blue coin that appears in episode 4 of Bianco Hills that just isn't there in any of the prior episodes. There's also this infamous one in the casino area of the Serena Beach Hotel that appears behind you only in episode 5. It isn't there when you come here in the episode right before this one. I couldn't tell you why. And some of the other blue coins throughout the game are just super obtuse. Like check out this one in Rico Harbor. Why the hell would anybody think to spray right there? Or there's this one in Pianta Village, where you spray at the waterfall in the center of the village. What? It's blue coins like this that set the precedent that they could be literally anywhere in the stage. So if you're dead set on not looking anything up, enjoy spraying every object there is. This sort of thing makes going for 100% completion a nightmare without a guide. Hell, even with a guide it can be tricky. My strategy was to avoid picking up all blue coins and levels until I'd completed the first 7 shines, then I'd go back in and go through each episode collecting as many blue coins as I could, keeping a running list of what I'd gotten. It's as tedious as it sounds, but it's a whole lot easier to keep track of. Speaking of tediousness, there are these piantas in Delfino Plaza that ask you to bring them a certain number of various fruits in exchange for a blue coin. These are already pretty lame challenges to rehash, but they're easy enough to complete in a few seconds. That is, until you get to this godforsaken durian one. See, fruits in this game are able to be held by Mario, with the exception of the durian. Durians have to be kicked to move, and there is basically no way to reliably control how much force goes into a kick unless you move at a snail's pace. Even then, they will seemingly get sudden bursts of speed and fly across the plaza. It is a tiresome challenge to complete, and it is indicative of a broader trend present in this game, padding. Sunshine has far too many shines that exist solely to waste the player's time. I think there were concerns over at Nintendo about how much content this game would have, so the devs just had to make do. I would personally consider the more lackluster objectives I mentioned earlier to fit under this umbrella, but I recognize that not many people will be satisfied with that, and that's okay. Different strokes for different folks and all that. However, I can point to three specific examples of shines that I think we can all agree absolutely fit this criteria. The first one is probably pretty obvious to most of you, the lily pad level. The entrance to this stage is on an island out in the ocean, but there's goop covering the top that only Yoshi can disintegrate. The problem is, Yoshi can't swim, so you've got to find a way to get him over there. So you grab Yoshi the fruit he wants, hop on his back, go down in the sewer and emerge at this island. Then, you have to wait for this boat to come get you, hop on it, wait for it to slowly, slowly make its way to this center platform. And then you get to do it all over again for the next boat. Slowly, slowly, and finally. You hop into the pipe and you're presented with what many say is the hardest level in the entire game. I've personally never had too much trouble with this one, but I can definitely understand why others do. It's a fast paced stage where one minor slip up means your death. I hope you stocked up on lives, because if you run out, you get brought back to Delfino Plaza, which means you have to go through that entire process all over again. Just getting to this island takes roughly 4 minutes, so that definitely adds to the perceived difficulty. This whole route is needlessly convoluted though. 
The goop should be permanently removed after spraying it once, but I don't even know if that would be enough. If there were a 4 minute lead up to this level that actually presented some kind of challenge to the player, I'd be singing a much different tune. As it exists now though, I dread this level every time I play, and I rarely even die here. The second example is the casino area of Serena Beach. This might win the award for the single worst Mario area ever for me. You'll enter the casino, and your first task is to get three lucky sevens on the two giant slot machines on the sides. There's no real skill or strategy to employ here, it's completely up to luck. If you're really unlucky, you could spend minutes on this part just waiting. Once you're finished there, you have to flip the panels on the wall to match up and display a shine sprite. The problem is, you have to do this with Flood, and Mario is too far back for the water to shoot accurately at a single panel. Panels below and to the sides will more than likely catch a stray blast of water and ruin your progress. There is a strategy to this part at least, but it can still take quite a while to complete. After overcoming your trials and tribulations, you will later have to come back to fight the shittiest boss in the game, King Boo. This fight is contingent on the slot machine landing on the food icon, which is tedious at best and agonizing at worst. To my knowledge, there's no way to influence what the slot machine lands on, so this fight boils down to just waiting. I've even heard of this level taking people over 15 minutes to complete through no fault of their own. You would think that such a simple task could be gotten over with easily, but I guess not. My final example of padding in sunshine is the 100 coin shines. These shines work just like how they did in Mario 64, which I liked collecting in that game for the record. And they're still just as fun in sunshine. But I have two issues with them here. The first is that it's quite literally impossible to collect 100 coins in certain episodes of some stages. This is yet another reason I don't like this game's progression structure very much. It wouldn't be such a big deal if the game had some way of telling you how many coins were in each episode, but that does not exist. The only way you'd ever know is if you collect 90 something coins and just cannot find any others throughout the entire level. This can make the process of getting these shines extremely stressful and tedious. I'll admit that there are only a handful of episodes across the entire game where this is an issue, but it seems to me like a huge oversight regardless. The second issue I have is that collecting the 100 coin shine boots you out of the level. Although I'm generally more permissive of the boot out system in Sunshine than in 64, it really bothers me here. The 100 coin star didn't boot you out in 64, which means that you could collect it alongside another star if you wanted to. I see no reason to make the change in Sunshine, especially because it's specifically going for immersion. I think it would have added on to the sense that I'm exploring these sandbox levels for collectibles, rather than completing objectives in a linear order. But no, they're just used as another excuse to get you to re-enter the level and walk the same path you already have 8 times before. Those are the worst defenders out of the shines, but I have another example of padding in relation to blue coins, Corona Mountain. This is the final level in the game, and the second half of it asks you to control this janky boat and navigate through a bunch of rocks in a lava pool. If you so much as nudge one of the rocks, you die. At the end, there are 10 blue coins placed in orbit of this central platform, with rocks littered about. Did I mention that this boat is janky? The best way to do this part is just repeatedly tapping the spray button until you can angle yourself perfectly to get the coins. Is it a total slog to play this way? Absolutely. Is it better than dying every 5 seconds? You bet it is. All of these issues create this feeling that Sunshine doesn't really respect your time. Some of these collectibles are a serious test of your determination. There are far too many boring, rushed, and poorly thought out challenges that make it difficult for me to consistently enjoy this game. My takeaway from everything I've discussed is that Sunshine is a roller coaster in video game form. A game of great highs and dismal lows. For everything the game gets right, it brings along two more issues. There's an effort to create a consistent world, complete with progressive stories throughout the stages, but player freedom and objective qualities suffer as a result. Players are rewarded with collectibles for exploring stages, but their applications are trivial and they are a nuisance to fully collect. Character movement is more fluid than ever, but it is only ever meaningfully tested in areas that feel separate from the game itself. The game has so much going for it, but its issues persist regardless. It was really disappointing to come back to Sunshine and realize I didn't enjoy it as much as I used to. I was half hoping that I would suddenly discover it was actually my favorite Mario game, 
just because of how in love I am with the setting and the movement, but I can't really get past the lackluster objectives and rigid structure. Had the game gotten just a little more time in the oven, I think it could have ended up a lot better. But even though the game doesn't appeal to my sensibilities, I will still acknowledge that it isn't inherently bad. After all, there are a huge amount of people out there who genuinely love this game. People whose brains are simply wired differently than mine. And they are completely valid in feeling that way. Although, I will never say I dislike it outright. For the most part, I enjoy playing Sunshine in the moment. I don't think its issues would bother me so much if I didn't like it to some degree. There is a reason I'd sit down to record footage for this video and play for hours on end, not even noticing the time passing by. There's an undeniable magic to running around Isle Delfino, and just soaking in the sights and sounds. It brings me back to when I was nearly 15 years younger, doing the exact same thing. For those moments, I can forget about the structural issues, those annoying blue coins I still haven't collected, or whatever else is on my mind. Perhaps that's really all that matters. That's about it for me. Thanks for watching.